Well, hi, Tarek. Thank you so much, so much for wel welcoming us today. Uh, for the audience, could you please briefly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Tarek Fancy. I'm the founder of Rumi, which yeah. is a digital education nonprofit. I also spent a long career mainly in finance and was most recently BlackRock's Chief Investment Officer for Sustainable Investing. That's, that's wonderful. So could you please tell us more about Rumi? What, what's the purpose behind uh, the initiative? So Rumi, really the idea is that you can learn pretty much anything for free online. Right? Digital learning has opened up all kinds of opportunities to mm -hmm. personalize learning, to deliver it you know, widely to mobile devices around the world really cheaply. But you know, it hasn't yet reached the people who have the most to gain. And so Rumi is really about taking learning and making it easy, fun, and engaging on a mobile phone and free you know, for anyone anywhere. That's, that's absolutely wonderful. So in 2018, uh, yeah, you became, as you mentioned, BlackRock's first uh, global CIO for sustainable investing. Prior to that, you went to several universities, uh, Brown, Sciences Po Paris, INSEAD. What exactly triggered your desire to, um, to leave the finance world? Like, what did you, what did you learn and, and what triggered that desire to just do something completely different? I think it was that um, I, I didn't really want to be in finance in the first place, okay. right? I mean, I graduated from undergrad. Yeah. I was a finalist for a scholarship I wanted to win for graduate study. Uh, I missed it in the final round, didn't really have much of a backup plan. And, you know, like a lot of people on, you know, college campuses, you know, anywhere, in this case in the U.S., you know, the, the investment banks and consulting firms appear on campus and they hoover up, you know, sort of the, a lot of the students that they, they like and think did well and don't know what, really what to do next. And so I kind of fell into it, did technology investment banking based in Silicon Valley with the big tech IPOs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, you know, spent a bunch of years doing for a while, what's called distressed and vulture investing in New York. If you think of the investment space and then you think of the hedge fund space, mm -hmm. the most aggressive, sharp elbowed are the vulture investors. They're buying bankrupt companies. So it's really one extreme. And you know what kind of led to me swinging back to the other side was that I had always had a passion for doing something with social impact. You know, the finance industry, you know, had, vulture investing wasn't it. And uh, so I took a year off, did an MBA, and there I met uh, a really close who became a really close friend, mm -hmm. who was from Holland. Uh, he and I both had worked in finance, had a passion for doing something useful for the world. Yeah. We graduated. We both went right back to finance because it's easy to get hoovered back in to the, you know, the, what seems like the easy path. And so some years after we graduated, um, he contracted stage four cancer. Uh, he was the same age as me. You know, he, um, stage four cancer, stage four melanoma in particular is, is extremely difficult. It's less a matter of your chances and you know, really just a matter of time. And so in this period, you know, he was fighting stage four cancer for two and a half years before he passed, sadly. Um, and, you know, in that period, if you're really close to someone, he'd be my roommate in business school, you know, you tend to almost sometimes live some, some things vicariously through them. And so in his case, you know, I saw firsthand that, you know, we would both sort of say, oh, we're going to do something, you know, someday. And we just push it off. Well, you know, when you have stage four melanoma, it's, it's now or never. And so he actually went to Kenya, where my parents were born and raised, mm -hmm. and he uh, founded a charity doing work around education. He did that all while fighting cancer at the end. And, you know, it was just a, uh, a real signal to me that um, when I'm at the end of my life, you know, what am I actually going to care about, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. can kick the can down the road for a while, but ultimately then you sort of see what, what really is meaningful. And uh, he had always pushed me to, to pursue the idea of Rumi. I'd worked years ago as an investor on bringing basic mobile phones into emerging markets, Kenya and other places. The idea being there was no landlines and you could sort of just do a leapfrog innovation straight to mobile. Great investment. It created a lot of infrastructure. It's been great for, for uh, those, those countries and communities. And the idea behind Rumi was another leapfrog, right? So as everyone has some form of mobile phone and they upgrade to a smartphone, you know, that is tremendously powerful in terms of the ability to, you know, disseminate information cheaply, right? It's what I call from books to bytes, yeah. right? Because, you know, it's just really, really cheap. And, um, and so since starting, we, you know, the Rumi is used in over 200 countries. Um, it's anywhere from kids in Detroit today who are actually, the data shows, replacing social media using Rumi's micro-learning solution, mm -hmm. five-minute courses. But it's also today, it's being used heavily by girls in Afghanistan, right? So it's, it's the same engine, but in local language, Dari and Pashto, and working with the mobile operator, we're bringing free learning, you know, to people who, you know, to be honest, we obviously started it, you know, a few years ago before the, the government fell, but mm -hmm. we already kind of knew that yeah. realistically, like, girls and women had less access to begin with, and that's 
become far worse. And so really that's the premise behind it is that, you know, you think of the Afghanistan example. If a girl has a mobile phone and a connection through the operator, um, we can deliver free learning yeah. in almost unlimited quantities. Absolutely. And she can use it safely from anywhere, right? At any time, from any place. And that gets around a lot of the barriers, right? The barriers that would exist in communities like that to do traditional in-person learning where there are all kinds of challenges, safety concerns, mm -hmm. and you know, frankly, a lot of people who, who want you know, to prevent it. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, that's incredible. And so basically, how does it work? Like, how do you choose the countries where you're gonna be implemented? Um, and basically, um, if, if you had to describe Rumi in very simple words, what is it exactly? Like, how, how does it actually work? So Rumi, I'd say the simplest way to think about it is it makes learning as fun and easy as social media. Mm -hmm. And so what we started to do is we started to take a look at how social media companies were keeping people engaged. Yeah. That's really important because people don't understand that learning and education, when you move it to online, it's, you can't just digitize the classroom experience yeah. because the biggest difference is in the classroom, you're a captive audience, right? You know, it's a lecture and if it's halfway through and you're bored, you, you can't just, the kid doesn't dump, jump out the window. Mm -hmm. But if you take that video lecture and you put it on someone's phone, every school system has learned this in the last two years of the pandemic, and you just ask people to watch that video, it's a very different experience because a kid is using it in their room at home and like within you know five minutes if they get bored, TikTok sends them a notification. You know, that real estate, digital real estate, you're up against the biggest tech companies in the world who are using troves of data on the population and data mm -hmm. on you mm -hmm. to keep hooking you on Absolutely. what they're doing. Yeah. So we looked at how they how they did that. Some of what they're doing is kind of nefarious, right? I mean, people have talked about how they're addicting people. But some of what they're doing is just good user experience. And so one of the things around good user experience is that if people are using mobile devices, right, which is the device of choice for the youngest and frankly for the poorest around the world, um, if that's your computer, you're not gonna learn the same way you learn on your desktop. Generally speaking, you, have, you want short snippets of information that are very quick. So with Instagram, you know, if you six minute session, you, you get a dopamine rush, mm -hmm. right? That's why people mm -hmm. keep coming back. This sounds short, but the average social media time per day is two and a half, three hours, right? Because they keep cutting time out all throughout your day. Yeah. Micro learning allows you to, which is, which is what we've been building, allows you to basically do a quick course in five or six minutes. And what we did to make it interesting is we, we just kept taking, looking at how social media was doing it and we kept trying to figure out how to keep people engaged with something good. And so today the format is quick. Uh, you get, it, data shows you get a dopamine rush from learning something also. So yeah. this is a way to, to, to add value to your life mm -hmm. over time by mm -hmm. doing something that gives you a dopamine rush. Um, but you know, more than that, the third party studies show it has 20 to 40% gains in learning retention. And most importantly, people just find it fun, right? So we have done studies in the US and found that um, over 80% of the students, um, when we asked them what micro learning competed with, they said uh, social media which was great for us because that's what we were trying to figure out how to hack. And our goal is it's a nonprofit. You know, mm -hmm. we're only ever going to collect people's data in a way that allows us to improve the learning experience. Yeah. Um, and then and the most important thing about us, we're a nonprofit because the content is created by volunteers, you know, companies, NGOs, other people who want to reach the TikTok generation. Mm -hmm. And they're looking, you know, in the last year we saw 10 times learner growth, right? Uh, it's actually accelerating now. And in large part, it's just because it's organic and people want to use it. So that, that really opens up a lot of possibilities. And, and so what type of content are you covering in terms of skills, knowledge? What is the outcome for students? And yeah, It's a good question. So our content is generally around job life and career skills. The, the truth is it's really bottoms up. So mm -hmm. one of the other differences with the education space, it often is top down because they have a you know, they just focus on quality because they don't have to think about engagement because they think of classrooms where people are locked in there. You know, they don't, they don't really think about what the learner wants. So we think a lot about not just what they need, which is skills in certain areas, but also what they want. Yeah. And by listening to the community, it's driven our content strategy around job skills, around how to get a job, improve your CV, mm -hmm. interviewing, mm -hmm. this, that, and the other. You know, what jobs do you even want? There's been a lot of socio uh, emotional kind of kind of information, soft skills. So mental health has been one of the biggest yeah. areas, yeah. Uh, and that's been driven just by the demands of, of learners, right? We have thousands of people on Discord, and a community we just started growing. And in a lot of ways, the content is just you know it's it's what it's a lot of what learners want themselves. So one of the taglines that the community, the, the youth community using it now has is, they say it's the things that we wish we learned in high school but yeah. didn't. Yeah. And what is one example of that? 
so <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's so many. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I guess if, if someone goes to roomy.org, which you can do yeah, on any device, yeah, definitely. Yeah, on your, on your phone in particular, of course. you know, you'll find a bunch of micro courses yeah. or what we call bites. Yeah. There'll be anything from, you know, how, you know, um, you know, how do I improve my resume with data? And it'll be like a simple thing with memes and animated GIFs. It's fun, but it has a couple of quizzes and it's trying to communicate some key points. And there'll be everything from how to interview, you know, how to answer specific interview questions. They're kind of the, the, um, the things that are really important but don't get passed along to underserved communities. Absolutely. What's interesting is that here we're sitting in Toronto, right, downtown Toronto. The province of Ontario, where we're based, has one of the best education systems in the world. Like for years it's ranked near Finland, sort of quite high. Um, and uh, what you tend to find is that the more affluent areas, the less affluent areas, um, those ones tend to, you know, the difference is less around the curriculum because they're all getting the same public curriculum. It's actually soft skills where the kids lose out because if you're in the tough part of town, mm -hmm. uh, you don't, you know, soft skills on like how to even get an internship or all these sort of know-how questions are, are passed through communities and families and all. So they don't, the recent immigrants don't get those. And that's why I think that's ended up being a pretty popular uh, area of content for us. That, that's wonderful. And, and can you tell, tell us more about where exactly Rumi is active? Uh, so obviously you mentioned developing countries, mm -hmm. but do you have a few examples of um, how you work with local communities in, in these um, different countries? So, you know, the early versions of what we were doing when we started in 2013, we would work through local partner organizations and yep. they would implement. Yep. At that point, we had sort of a hardware solution to help them because often they didn't have an internet connection and so on. But today, um, you know, people find it on their own, right? So the learner growth is like anything from us doing search engine optimization to working through partners and a whole set of other things. Uh, and largely organic, it seems like people sharing it. Um, but um, you know, it, we we work around the world in the sense that it's used there's no, no barrier in terms yeah, of there's people, no ge geographical barriers. That's, that's what, what you're thing, saying, right? I yeah. mean, we yeah. clearly lean into certain countries. Um, you know, Afghanistan has been we've been working uh, there since 2017 with mm -hmm. local partners. We leaned into that because we had a great partner network. There was a need. It was you know that much more powerful in communities where the alternatives are are, are, are less. Um, but actually, our biggest growth areas today uh, are the U.S. and India. Um, India, I think, just generally because you have lots of people, they're fairly tech, tech savvy and they figure out whether there's mm -hmm. free learning solutions. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. in particular is one we're really interested in because we started out working on developing countries, right? It was working with Syrian refugee camps and so on. As we've improved the solution, it's now something that actually seems to really resonate with people, young people in, in, in affluent countries mm -hmm. also. And that's a huge mark of success for us, right? If we're good enough to like compete with, you know, in 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 cities in North America, then it, you know, where the people again, they're not they're not going to take with anything they can get. Like they're just really going to be focused on the best thing. It shows that we've kind of hit a formula that seems to work. Right. And now a big question: Why education? You could have maybe you know chosen so many different topics. Why is education? essential in your opinion to help lift millions out of poverty and maybe help them have a better life and create a better life for the people around them as well. I think the most important thing for education is it allows someone to realize their innate potential, right? Everybody has potential. Yeah, absolutely. The, the challenge that. is that not many people don't get to, to realize it and it's yeah, either because they definitely. lack access, there's barriers in the way, often it's the way they're taught, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, if you if you know certain things you can teach in, in a way that people don't feel included, particularly underserved communities. So as we try to bridge that gap, I think the motivation for me is in large part, you know, my, uh, my, my family, right? My, my mother's family had eight siblings. Um, they immigrated from Kenya. Uh, of those eight siblings, I had an uncle who um, was the smartest of, you know, of a family that had done pretty well academically generally. And um, he uh, never got a chance to go to school because he had a physical handicap. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s in Nairobi, you know, there was no accessible school bus to, to yeah. take him to school. And so, you know, he kind of was taught to read and then self-taught himself over the years. He was by far the smartest member of the family. I mean, he was near genius level, let's say, from what I saw. Um, but in the end, he, he passed away because of medical complications that he had through his entire life when he was fairly young. And I just looked at him and I thought to myself, you know, this is someone who could have... Uh, done extraordinary things for the world. Um, uh, and you know, the, the idea that he was denied access to education and to, lear you know, to learning more broadly was something that always kind of stayed with me. And, and it's it, it, for that reason, I think, you know, really empowering people around the world 
um, in a lifelong learning way, not just the traditional like K twelve. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, absolutely, yeah, you is, is important in a, a in a fast changing you world, but B you know particularly level of playing field for communities that don't receive access. That, that that makes a lot of sense. I completely share that that vision. And what would you say are the most important skills um, to 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 develop as a you know as a teenager, for example, if you're 13, 14, 15, what do you think should teenagers focus on in terms of knowledge? and skills to develop their full potential? You know, it's interesting. I mean, this is a, a lot of what we do is based on research. So we'll mm -hmm. look at trying to figure out what seems to work or data. This is probably a question where I would just sort of give my opinion. Yeah. Um, I would say that, you know, the most important skills are probably socio-emotional first. You know, you need to have self-confidence, mm -hmm. right? You need mm -hmm. to have a certain set of soft skills, I think, that form the foundation to allow people to feel confident, to have an intrinsic motivation, yeah, desire to learn. It sounds obvious sometimes. People say, well, yeah, of course. Or like, why are you mentioning that? Because they're focused on the hard skills. Often that's because, again, you know, more, um, the less served communities and, and the people really need it most, often they don't have that foundation. And it will push them on a path where they could have picked up the hard skills. They could have gone through all the educational system and really, you know, um, invested in themselves in a way that would allow them to, to, to you know, get a great job and live a comfortable life but you know if they don't have that piece at the beginning it's difficult and some part of that is even outside of the educational system right it, it's it's related to you know uh, inequality uh, safety in communities you know the, the home environment that kids go to which we've seen in the last two years as people went home you know you could have an equal playing field in a classroom but mm -hmm. then if they go home and you know one house has a fast internet connection and all of the amenities and Another one, you know, it's a completely different environment. There's domestic violence, just that, you know, it, it, it makes it a lot harder. Yeah. Now, going back to traditional education models in, you know, in the Western world, we can talk about Europe, um, North America. What are your thoughts on the current education models and what do you think we can, you know, change to make it better? Because very often we talk about product productivity levels. We talk about, you know, the amount of time we spend at school, mm -hmm. you know, from you know, until, until you were 21, if you complete a bachelor degree. And, you know, the productivity of all the time that you spend at school in terms of the, again, the knowledge and the skills that you've been building. So from your perspective, what would you do differently um, uh, when designing education models? It's a big one. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think the most important thing is that the education space needs to try more things and take yeah. more risks yeah. and do it in a way that is human-centric. So mm -hmm. what I mean by that is in the first place, the education space is by far the slowest moving and most risk-averse industry I've ever seen. Definitely. And I've worked and invested across different places. It's just, you know, if something seems to work, like if I have a great app and people want to download it, it can get 50 million downloads in a few months, right? It can grow widely. But that's because there's no barrier, right? Anyone just decides on their phone to download it, never everyone can do it at once. To get something into a classroom, right, it, do, it doesn't just have to work well. It has to be evaluated a million times. It has to go to curriculum committees. Like, it's very, very, it's a very slow moving mm -hmm. system, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. adapt as much, I think, to the world around it as it should have. Mm -hmm. And it's less responsive in some part because of, if you think of the model, you know, if I'm providing a service and you're, let's say I'm Apple, I sell iPhones, you're buying it. I get my revenue that funds the organization from you, so I have to keep you happy. Right? I'm listening to everything you're saying and I'm going to try to build the best iPhone. Education and publicly provided services, you know, you might be the student and I'm the teacher, but you don't pay my salary, right? That goes to the taxes and then eventually, you know, I get paid and I give you a service, but as a result, you don't have, I don't have to keep you happy in the Absolutely. same way, right? Because if you don't buy the iPhone, that's a problem for Apple, you know, you don't have a choice. You can't, you know, switch schools easily or fire your teacher. And so on some level, it seems to be very slow moving. Um, so that's one big issue. Second big issue that you know, I think is related is that um, a lot of the models are around, you know, what the student needs. And I think that's not enough, A, in a digital world, and B, in a world where you have lots of students, especially from underserved communities that, who are disengaged. You've got to figure out what they want yeah. and how to make it engaging. So it's what they, they you know, what they need, sorry, and what they want, right? And, and that's, you know, I think of like, if you watch the news, right, you could watch the news on a certain issue, or you could watch John Stewart or Trevor Noah or John Oliver. They're going to take the news 
it's no less intelligent, but they're just going to make it entertaining and funny. And so some, some of what we're trying to do with Rumi is, is figure out that piece, right? Because if you do that well, you can actually start to engage the students who, you know, without that, may sort of go on a different track. And they'll have potential, but they'll never fully get realized because the system taught in only one particular way. And, uh, and it wasn't sort of, you know, it wasn't looking to try to engage mm -hmm. the students. Because if you just look at the ones who are already motivated and they're showing up first yeah. in class yeah. and all, I mean, they're going to figure, if you shut the school, they're going to be on Khan Academy. They're going to find 50 other things. Yeah, definitely. It's really the, the layer below who, you know, they've sometimes never been taught to be confident. Exactly. Right? They've never, you know, they don't have, I did Big Brothers for many years in New York, right? I had a, a little brother who lived in housing projects. And I started to realize that the best thing I could do for him was just to be an example. Right, because otherwise, if he didn't know anyone who had gone a certain path, you know, to go to college and get a job and so on, it became harder for him to imagine himself doing it. And so a lot of it is just really thinking about the experience of the learner and how it can be tailored to sort of bring out the best in them. Yeah, and, may, and I would add on that. So first, I, I totally agree with you. And, and second, maybe bridge the gap between the academic and the prof prof professional world. So if we could, mm. for example, have companies work with students during the curriculum, for example, mm -hmm. like have, um, you know, students collaborating uh, within a group of five or six students for five weeks. They work on projects, they work on mandates for companies and, and make it practical. I think that would that would also mm -hmm. um, add value, in my opinion. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, you about the content, how you create the content at Rumi. So who are you exactly collaborating with to make sure that you have um, a relevant piece of content? So I'd say that so the most important thing about the Rumi model is it's largely volunteer driven. We, our content's all open and free. It's Creative Commons. Yeah, yeah. As a result of that, um, we know that we can engage people around the world who have skills to give to you know, really take part in a digital skills transfer. Um, and that makes the model very powerful because us being a nonprofit then you know, also allows us to you know, engage lots and lots of people like Wikipedia did. We've seen the power of what that could do mm -hmm. with Wikipedia and a yeah. whole bunch of other sites like that. That allows us to today scale very cheaply, right, to move, you know, we have people creating content in local, you know, languages in Afghanistan and other things where, you know, you quickly move into different subject areas and cultures and so on. And I think fundamental to our model is a little bit like a two-sided marketplace, right? You have skilled volunteers engaging and creating content that's very simple and that we coach them on how to make on you know, transferring skills. And then you have a growing learner community that's fast growing and they're sort of using it and requesting mm -hmm. it. And so both through what the community, you know, their actual the data anonymously of how they engage with it, you start mm -hmm. to figure out what content works and doesn't. And more importantly today, you know, through actually having a community that gives us feedback, we start to figure out, okay, these are the areas of content that are very much in demand. We have a community, you know, you match it with people who have skills and then, you know, you really have a transformative process that scales cheaply mm -hmm. and um, and creates a large public resource, much like Wikipedia, that yeah. anyone can use. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Um, now, going back to your um, professional experience, I would say, either with BlackRock, with Rumi, the, the other work experiences yet that you had, what are your biggest learnings? Like, what, what is something that you didn't expect that happened and, and that probably brought you perspective? You know, I think the most important thing that that I learned and I think um, is important for people who want to be activists towards the SDGs is that we need to be a little bit more evil. And that's going to sound odd. How can you yeah, be evil yeah, to, but like, interesting. to the SDGs? That's interesting, yes. But, you know, I had worked on the most aggressive style of investing. So I knew kind of the, you know, the sharp elbowed version. I went to the nonprofit space, built roomy, you know, purely social impact. I didn't take salary for mm -hmm. years. It was, mm -hmm. you know, a real passion mm -hmm. project. When I went back to finance and started evaluating a lot of you know, sustainable investing, green investing, ESG, all these things which I was effectively responsible for, um, it was, what worried me was that I kept seeing the exact same model of business with a bunch of marketing on top. And the reason was that generally speaking, in, you know, to change the system, you need systemic change, right? Like you need, mm -hmm. you need government regulation mm -hmm. to step in. Mm -hmm. So l let's take an example. Yeah. COVID-19, right? It hits the world and the government says, shit, we need to flatten the curve. They're talking about the infections curve. So, you know, they don't leave that to the free market. They realize, oh my God, this thing, if the incubation period is a few weeks, like mm -hmm. we need to move fast. 
government closes the schools, closes bars, you know, makes masks mandatory, restricts travel. These are all government using special powers that only it has, right, to legally change the rules for everybody, mm -hmm. and that only governments have the democratic legitimacy to actually pursue. Um, then, while the government's holding down one, you know, the, the curve with one hand, they immediately create um, a bunch of uh, incentives for the private sector to, to, to produce vaccines, right? So in the U.S., they had a Operation Warp Speed, right? And this, you know, this was actually saying, look, obviously the private sector is going to, you know, pharma companies are going to build the vaccines. They've, that's their business. But you have to galvanize them to do it. That so it required direct R&D to these companies. Yeah pre-orders from multiple vaccine makers so that instead of just having one you know horse in the race you have six or seven so one of them will get to the finish line first all of that allowed us to hold down the curve quickly find a solution with a vaccine and get to a point where we're you know exiting probably in this rich countries anyway the, the pandemic this year now look at look at climate change yeah climate change is a systemic curve that science tells us to flatten it's the exact same thing except that it's greenhouse gas emissions and the accumulation is much slower so it's a, we have to flatten the curve. The curve's gone out of control, right? But the incubation period is not weeks, it's decades. So instead of the government using the tools of its power, which everybody knows, it's a price on carbon. Definitely it's taxes. Vehicle, yeah, taxes and regulation. It's vehicle emissions limits. It's energy efficiency standards for buildings. It's, you know, you're going to have to close or prevent, you know, new, new plants with dirty, dirty energy. None of those things are happening, right? None of those things happen today. Um, because frankly, you know, those things cost money and the mm -hmm. private sector mm -hmm. doesn't want to pay, cost money, pay anything, right? Mm -hmm. So what you find is you have a bunch of companies that are putting out CSR statements that look really, really glossy and they look nice and it's wonderful. Um, and behind the scenes, in the US at least, you know, they're paying politicians. And we don't even know how much, right? After the Citizens United Supreme Court decision in 2010, corporate political spending is untraceable and potentially in unlimited amounts. So I always make the analogy for capitalism, say, like, it's a competitive sport, mm -hmm. right? Competitive markets are competitive sports. You have a, bit of, a bunch of rules, and you have participants, in capitalism's case, competing for profits. In the case of, let's say, basketball, they're competing for points. And at some point, you need the referees to do their job, right, to come in and, and change the rules and, and enforce them. And what we've found, you know, in recent years, that's not happening, right? Um, we, we need them to come in and do all these things to, you know, to flatten the curve, but they're not doing them. Yeah. They're yeah. not doing an Operation Warp Speed, which we already know for green energy, you do heavy investments in base research around battery storage, renewable, you know, carbon capture and storage, so on. All those need to be galvanized by the government. Um, and if you read the research, the government, you know, indirectly created Silicon Valley, right? The iPhone, a whole bunch of things wouldn't exist without government investment Absolutely, yeah. and base research. None of those are happening right now. And what businesses, particularly in the U.S. seem to be doing, is they're publishing a glossy CSR report and then they're paying the politicians and not disclosing it. If you use a sports analogy, it would be like the game has devolved into dirty play, right? We need to fix it. Um, and they are arguing that we should rely on good sportsmanship, which is just them deciding to do the right thing voluntarily. And they're offering us, you know, talking points on good sportsmanship after the game, but they're not telling us if they're paying the refs. When I say being evil, I mean, you know, I came from a world where I could read the bullshit in five seconds, and what I didn't like was that I saw a bunch of narratives and products that they were just, they were marketing. Mm -hmm. And so every single year you see ESG words go up, you see ESG assets go up, right? You know, and the sustainable green investing grows, and it grows alongside carbon emissions and inequality and all the things that in theory it's meant to do something about. Mm -hmm. That's because the mechanics of behind the scenes, there's nothing different, it's there's moving money around. Um, and so I'd say the, big, the biggest and most important thing is that, you know, when Greta Thunberg says that all she's hearing is blah, 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 yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on her team. Like the, and I, and I, I, my goal is to explain to people why that's happening. It's because they actually haven't changed the system. They just put green paint on mm -hmm. it. The only way that changes is through people using, you know, their voting powers, right, to actually go and, and force change at the regulatory level, right, which is like saying, hey, the referees need to come back in. They need to fix the rules and they need to enforce them. I'm very skeptical of a lot of the messaging that comes out that says like business will do all good things on its own because I saw through looking at trying to do this at the largest investment firm in history with 10 trillion it doesn't work and we're just running out of time. So my, what I've learned and what I would pass on to people is yeah. that you know sometimes to create social change you can't be kumbaya, right? Like Malcolm X wouldn't get, wouldn't get very far if he was doing the kumbaya thing, right? Sometimes you have to have sharp elbows and, and I think that um, you know I, I, I think that 
we really need to be a lot more aggressive in calling bullshit on a lot of what's mm -hmm. coming out of, you know, a lot of the virtue signaling coming out of companies, even politicians mm -hmm. who they're giving us blah, blah, blah. Nothing ever gets done. And it just erodes, you know, destroys the planet and erodes the faith of the public in the system. And do you have any examples in mind of people who are actually, you know, trying to make a change? People that are probably uh, government officials, uh, maybe you have a country in mind um, that could serve as an example. Yeah, there are a number of, of really good examples of things happening, you know, on, on the margins. I think I would say that, you know, you, you have, there are great things happening in certain countries, and the Scandinavian countries yeah, tend to be sort of in a leadership position on that. Um, I th you know, it's a tough one because I think a lot of democracies are going to be tethered to the speed of the U.S. or mm -hmm. the biggest economies. Like mm -hmm. here in Canada, people want to do something about climate change, but it's very difficult to institute a very aggressive carbon tax when you're part of a free trade agreement with the U.S. and they don't have one. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think of any of the regulatory things. You want to increase the minimum wage. You want to increase corporate tax so you can pay for social programs. You want to institute a carbon tax. All of these things cost money. And as long as you know certain countries are basically blocking it, um, it gets very difficult, let's say, for other ones to mm -hmm. go too far without mm -hmm. their own industry saying, hey, why are we doing this alone? It's not making a difference. Mm -hmm. So I think there are examples of, of things that are, are um, moving in the right direction. But I'd say the biggest thing is this decade we're going to see a switch back to the importance of the role of government. Yeah. We just saw That's with flattening point. the COVID curve, it's going to have to be the lead yeah. on flattening the, yeah. the um you know, the uh, emissions curve. And, and I'd say that the best things I've seen recently have been movements growing to say, hey, we need to fix the rules, right? And that's going to require government intervention. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for your insights today. That was absolutely mind-blowing from my, from my end. Uh, do you have any last thoughts, advices for the audience, maybe? Not really. I mean, I look, I'd say, <laughs> I'd say, look, first of all, I think it's great you guys are doing this, right? I mean, I think you. you need to, to surface the most important stories um, and inspire people to say that there is, you know, a, a chance for change. And I wouldn't say people should be fatalists, mm -hmm. right? I, I think mm -hmm. it's, exactly. it's a, it's a hard agree. struggle, I but, but I do think that um, achieving the results on the timeline we need is going to require us to throw some punches, frankly. Yeah. yeah. And um, and that would be and my take message. Take some punches to, as well. <laughs> take some. I mean, it's a. It's you know, at the end of the day, again, it's going to cost a lot of money. We're talking trillions of dollars. Um, there's going to be a stupid message around this that you're going to hear all the time, which is we're all in this together, right? We're, you know, this is, we're all, this is all our fight. Given your age, for younger people, I would say call bullshit on that all day. There's absolutely no reason to believe right now that we're all in this together. Take BlackRock as an example, right? My old boss, CEO, turned 70 this year. Um, I don't think his messaging has been at all responsible. I think it's misleading the public and delaying regulatory action, and I've been arguing this publicly for the last year. Mm -hmm. Um, he's turning 70, he's paid the most at the firm, and he's least at risk of the consequences of inaction. Now turn around and look at his 22-year-old entry-level employee, right? She is paid at the bottom, because she just joined entry-level, and is most at the risk of the consequences of inaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I find some of the messaging around the climate crisis in particular to be just cynical and misleading because it says, oh, we're all in this together. And it's like British Petroleum or something. Well, I'm not sure. Like, you know, I, th I think that, you know, my, the bo most important thing is that the results we've seen in the last decade have been terrible. And so we need to jettison models that don't make sense. Divesting of fossil fuel makers, complete waste of time. You don't, it, 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 there's no, you know, that's not how financial markets work. If you sell shares in the open market, someone buys them in the end. There's a whole bunch of models that have been pushed, and you know, I think even the climate community often does itself a disservice by mixing up and muddling 25 things. And when you debate with them, they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's not either or. You can do all of these things. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense. That'd be mm -hmm. like us saying, hey, how do we fight COVID? And you know, hey, like, here's some horse tranquilizers and some masks and some drink some bleach, have some bleach. I mean, it's nonsense. There's only a few things, right? And there's a clutter of misinformation. You need to be laser focused on the few things that drive value. And you got to call bullshit on the other ones. And the fact that we haven't in the last 10 or 15 yeah. years, and I think a lot of energy has been spread on, like, things that have no impact, right? Like, you know, me cycling the work, that's a wonderful thing to do, right? But that's like me saying I can wear a mask and that's all we need. No, no, we need a mask mandate also, right? Because if good people do the right thing, it's not enough. Because, you know, with the climate crisis as with COVID, we're going to be defined by the speed of the laggards, not the leaders, right? And so that's why the reform has that's to be really systemic. Good point. It has really to be good. systemic. It has to be led by government. 
anything short of that is often, and what I saw firsthand, they were intentionally misleading narratives that seemed designed to convince people that you don't need, you know, if you use a sports analogy, it's like, no, no, don't call the referees in. Good sportsmanship, right? Yeah. Stakeholder capitalism. Yeah, that's, that's not how the system that's not works. How the, the game works. I that's guess. not how the game works. I saw something yeah. that's not how it works. You're, they're going to focus on profit yeah. always. Yeah. Purpose is nice as a marketing thing. Mm -hmm. It's not even because they're bad people. The system works that way because yeah. they're legally obligated to do yeah. that. They're financially incentivized to do that. Definitely. And that's why economists keep saying, like, no, no, we need, you know, we need government to institute policy reforms, and you know, they've been slower to do that because, you know, it's hard to get it, people focused on it if they're doing 19 different things to create, you know, change the problem, to fight the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. Again, wonderful insights. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, yeah, thank oh, you. Cool. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Yeah,